It's LeBron James. You guys know who LeBron James is. I put him on the front slide here because this article about a month ago, LeBron reveals the nutritional changes he makes to elevate his performance during the postseason. LeBron changes his nutrition during the postseason. This is a quote from LeBron James. You guys don't have to be able to read it all. I'll, I'll do the first part here. The thing that I started cutting down is the sugars. When it comes to playoffs, it kind of slows down the process of recovery. He's correct. Excess sugar, right, when we take it in, actually slows down the process of the body being able to recover. We'll talk a little bit about that tonight. He goes a little bit further and he says, but in the postseason, optimal recovery, whoever can recover the fastest from game to game, is going to put themselves in position to be successful. So the sugars I kind of cut out, but the carbs I kind of ramp up. Though he might be a little off on how he's wording this stuff, LeBron James sees that there's a difference between carbs and sugars. In other words, they're not synonymous with one another. He ramps one of them up and he cuts the other one down. By the end of the night, I hope you guys will know why and also to give you guys a few tips about what you guys can do as both parents and athletes to be able to optimize your performance as well. So, Again, my name is Nick Pertwee. This is what I did for a living for quite a while. Uh, most of my football career, I, I spent in the Arena Football League, the AFL, uh, down in San Jose, California. That's me up there in the top left. In 2014, I was voted one of the best 50 players to play the game of Arena Football, which was kind of fun because that's all I did for a living. I kicked the ball, right? That was it. So I was a kicker. We had some fun times. Uh, we won the Arena Bowl, uh, one, which was at one time the largest uh, championship trophy in America, which was kind of cool as well. But I learned some things along this game. One is how to perform right under pressure. And you're a kicker. Half the room automatically hates you when you step into the room, right? I don't, actually, maybe it's more than that, because even your own team sometimes is always like, the kickers you go there. So there's this idea of there's this outside pressure to perform, but then there's also the point that in arena football, we kick at nine-foot goalposts. They're 15 feet off the ground and only nine feet wide. To give you an example, NFL was 18 and a half feet. High school is 24 feet wide, so we were pretty narrow. What you learn along the way to kick to be successful in that is not a ton about power, but it's about how you kick the ball to keep it as accurate as possible. There's a technique to that. When you step up to the ball, you're only about a foot away from the ball. What this allows you to do is you come in to swing, you can keep your chest over the ball, you can keep your hips really in line with the ball, you have a longer contact with the ball, and as a result, you can place it a lot better. This is similar to golf, right? In golf, we know that if you want accuracy, you want to be over the ball, close to it. So you use a putter when you go for as close as possible. But when you go to kick off, right, when I would go to kick off, I'm no longer a foot away, but I'm like a foot and a half away, right? And as I go to swing, my shoulders are away from the ball. I open the hips up a lot more. And with the same swing as before, you can kick the ball even further, right? Golf does the same thing. That's why when you line up with a driver, your, your shoulders are away from the ball. There's a further distance between you and the... It's technique that matters. Right? There is a strategy and a skill, or sorry, a strategy and a, uh, a technique to this skill, just like there's a strategy and there's techniques to optimizing performance, and that's my goal tonight, right? To help you guys with little techniques that through little changes can optimize your performance as much as possible. Right? Outside of playing football, when I got done with that, I worked for a few different universities, University of Texas, Stanford University, and now I found myself up in uh, Billings, Montana, as uh, the director of the Health and Human Performance Department. I study human performance, right? That machine right there, by the way, we have down here in Cody, I think for the next 10 days. Some of the athletes jumped on it today. Um, you guys can get a hold of Deb White, Cody can if you want to uh, try this out as well. I think they'll have it down here for 10 days. It's a pretty cool body composition breakdown, and we're trying to bring technology into this world to try to optimize performance by knowing more about your bodies as well. So this is what I do now full time. I teach, right? I enjoy it quite a bit, but I enjoy this probably most, getting out into the communities and actually talking with people as well. So before I forget, before this all ends, I'm going to hang out for at least 30 minutes after this all gets done. If you guys have any questions, please feel free to hang out. I talk kind of quick. So I bet we'll get done in less than 45 minutes too, just so you guys know. Okay, so one thing I've learned along the way of teaching is I can't do all the talking. I gotta take a little breaks. So we're gonna have five or six of these real quick. These are just to get you guys thinking. So you're gonna actually uh, just talk to the people next to you real fast. Here's something to make sure your brains are turned on and you're not already bored of me being up here, right? Um, here's, here's the question. Muscles can only push and pull. Let's see how you guys do it. You didn't think this was gonna be class, did you, coming here tonight, right? A, false. They can only do less than that. B, false. They can do much more than that. Or C, true. 
Here are some examples of why. See real quick, I'm gonna give you 20 seconds. Tell the person next to you what do you think the correct answer is. Okay, let's see how you guys did. This is from the National Strength and Conditioning Association. They say, the muscles of the body do not act directly to exert force on the ground or other objects. Instead, they function by pulling against bones that rotate about joints and transmit force to the mind. Muscles can only pull, not push. So if you said A, correct. Good job, you can brag to the people next to you. That's what it looks like. Biomechanically, even when we push something with our triceps, it's the muscle pulling on the other side of the elbow to extend it, right? When we do a bicep curl, it's pulling upward because it attaches past our elbow. When even when we push against the ground to stand up, it's actually our calf muscles pulling upward. Muscles can only pull, not push, so that's pretty good. The idea behind this is to keep you guys awake and keep your brains lit up as we go through this. All right. You guys know this company, this is McDonald's, right? In the late 90s, early 2000s, this is not what I'm telling you to eat, by the way, right? That's not the, the talk tonight. This is early 90, or late 90s, early 2000s, this is the only way they advertised. This was it. About the mid-2000s, they started advertising like this. Looks healthier, doesn't it? Green, they put, they put some vegetables on there as well. They are trying to influence you to buy something because they want you to believe it's actually a healthy choice as well. People will pay $2 for a bottle of water, tap water. You pay money for it. These companies don't go out of business, they make actually good money. People also pay about five to seven dollars a bottle per bottle of water when it's a people water and they actually donate water to somebody else. Why are you buying water? What's inspiring people to buy seven dollar bottles of water? Right? What's better for you? Butter or margarine? You don't have to answer that one. Why do you think one of those is better for you? One of them has less calories, if that's all that mattered. The paper you guys were handed out today has very few calories. Eat that all day if you want, right? One of them's one chemical bond away from being plastic. It's that one. But you believe one of those is better for you or not. My point going into this is, why do we believe what we believe about health? You have reasons that you believe certain things about health, and why do you believe those? And the thing is, I don't think I could ever change any of your behaviors or have you guys actually take on things to optimize performance if you don't first stop and go, yeah, why do I think that? Why do I think which one's better, butter or margarine? Right? As we go through this, I'm guessing that your influences have come in lots of places. They've come from classrooms and teachers. They've come from Uncle Bob, your coaches, the guy at the gym. That's, that's steroids. That's what that, that's, from magazines that you read, popular media, what we're being advertised to, what you look up on the internet, your own experience. There's lots of things that influence why you believe the things you believe about health, right? Let's start with an easy one. Okay, I want to eat healthy. Pretty simple. It's actually a good idea to eat healthy, right? Because eating healthy is eating food that's fuel for your body, and we know this from science. We know the better your body will run, the better you eat. You'll feel better. The sharper you'll think, you'll be a happier person. Guess what? You'll make more money if you eat healthier. Scientifically proven facts. Right? So why don't you eat healthier? So you say, of course I'll eat healthier. Right? So you decide, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go eat healthier because I can make more money if nothing else. Or I'm happier or I run better as we go through this. And so you go to go look up what does it mean to eat healthier. And you go and you find this. You say, it's, if your parents may know this one, right? This, is the, this, is the, this was the food pyramid, right? Back in the old uh, junior high textbooks. I don't know if it looks like this anymore. Probably doesn't, because that was the original food pyramid. And then somebody came along and said, that's not a good food pyramid. That's a good food pyramid. Water is the most important thing to drink, right? So water goes on bottom. Then we can have the grains and vegetables and everything else. Until somebody comes and said, uh, no, carbs aren't good for you. Get rid of all the carbs. What you need to eat is anything but carbs, right? And so this became the new food pyramid. Eat as much of that as you want until people started dying of heart attacks, and we had to rethink some of it. And then they said, you're right, we do need healthy fats. Here they go, right? They can go on bottom, but exercise is most important. Throw that on bottom, right? Put the grains here, get some alcohol floating on the outside, keep people happy, right? As they go through. Then some other smart people showed up, and they go, oh, no, don't put them in layers. Put the pyramid in stripes, because then it says that everything's just as important. Get kids doing cartwheels on the outside, show some examples you do it, until some smart Ivy League professors came along, and they said, no, 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 you do a plate. A plate's the way to show people how to eat. And tell the rest of us who are sitting here going, how do I eat healthy? 
right? <laughs> we don't even know by the end of all this, right? We're stuck. We're stuck even knowing what to do next because we don't know. My job tonight, I'm giving a little science background for it, and then I'm going to get into 10 rules, is to help you guys navigate that. Right? I read the boring research articles that you don't have to read. I go through this. I've worked with teams from semi-professional to college to professional athletes. And we know what works for performance, and I'm going to share some of that with you guys and hopefully help you out to navigate through this. All right. Done with me for a second. We have to take little breaks. Number two, like our vehicles, any machine around us, right? We need, and any machine around us, we need energy to work. Our energy is contained in chemical bonds floating out there in the universe. Isn't that crazy? Right? There's these energy floating out there and we've got to go eat them. We have to go Pac-Man those things up. That's what that means, right? We've got to go chomp them up. What are the three ways that energy is stored out there in nature? See how you guys do on this one. Talk to the person next to you. 20 seconds. Okay, so instead of going to like the gas station and fueling up, we have to go out to nature and start chomping on things. And if you said these three things, you are correct. If you said carbohydrates, proteins, and fats are the three main ways that we have energy out there, you're correct. All those are describing bonds that store energy for us. Here's a bonus, see if you can follow up. Only one of those can be broken down without oxygen present. That means anaerobically, right? Well, only one of those three can be broken down without oxygen. See how you do on this one? I'll give you five seconds. What do you think it is? The correct answer is, I hope we got it. Carbohydrates are the only one that can be broken down anaerobically without oxygen present. Here's our real fuel. Our real fuel is something called adenosine triphosphate, ATP. The way this really works is our body breaks down these bonds and it releases energy, right? To get energy back, we have to build those bonds back up. How fun does that look, right? That's chemistry, right? There. What we know about this is that's how our body works. It has to create fuel, not gasoline, but we use something called ATP. We have to break ATP into ADP, adenosine diphosphate. Then we have to build it back up in order to get energy again. And there are different energy systems that help with that. That's a lot of science in one slide, so I'm going to give you guys a break again as we go through this, and I'm going to jump ahead to this. Right? Because muscle cells store ATP only in limited amounts, Right? They only have a, so much. We're, we're a physical being, right? And activity requires a constant supply of ATP to provide the energy needed. ATP producing processes must occur in the cell. Right? This is what happens. You have to regenerate your own fuel. What are these processes and what do you know about that? Oh, this is a tough one. You had to guess the three types of bonds. Now, do you know anything about the energy processes where we remake ATP? I'll give you a hint. I've already said two of them tonight if you were listening. 20 seconds, see if you know them. Okay, this one was tougher. You guys didn't know you were coming to school already. It's supposed to start next week, and I'm already asking a question. Parents, sorry. Let's see how you guys did, though. There are energy processes. They go by a few different names, right? One of them is called the phosphagen system, or the phosphate system, or the creatine phosphate system. The next one is called glycolysis, or anaerobic glycolysis, right? Or aerobic glycolysis, faster. So, and the last one's called the aerobic system, or the oxidative system. Anybody get all three? I can kind of see. I'll pretend that I saw a couple of hands. Good job. All right. Going to the next one. What, the, what are these energy systems I talk about? You need fuel. You don't just magically create power out of nowhere. You need fuel. It comes in carbs, fats, and proteins. Your body has to replenish your fuel systems. It has three major systems. The phosphagen system is when you're doing something really high power output. Sprinting, lifting a heavy weight, jumping, changing directions quickly. Does this sound like sports? Yes, right? This phosphagen system, what it does is it's stored in your muscles, right? And it's stored as ATP, and then it's also stored as a little extra, something called creatine phosphate, right? 
extra creatine holds on to phosphates, they give energy right back so you can create higher power output. The next system, glycolysis, right, it breaks down glucose and glycogen, which is stored in the muscles and liver. You guys don't have to memorize all this, but this is foreshadowing to stuff later on. The third system, the one that goes even longer than all of them, the system you're mainly in right now, I don't, I don't look out there and see anybody like panting and falling over. Most of us are in our, mainly in our aerobic system. You're breathing in oxygen. It's being used to replenish your ATP. These other systems aren't doing much of the work right now. It's mainly this one. This one uses glucose, glycogen, but it also uses right, adipose and, and uh, fat tissue found in the muscles as well. So it's a pretty interesting one because it could use all three things, but the only one that can be broken down by this system, the system that you know, you have to sprint and then sprint again, or you have to do something for more than 10 seconds long, right? This glycogen system can only be run on the anaerobic side by carbohydrates. Keep that in mind as we go through this. <clears throat> Here's how the systems come into play with different sports. I know that's a lot up there at once. See if you can find your sport and then go over and see what systems are being used as you guys look at these ones. Notice how important the phosphagen system, right? Notice how important the anaerobic glycolysis. Notice how important, oh wait. Not many of them rely very much on the aerobic system, do they, right? I'm not trying to say don't go out and go for a jog or run, but these energy systems are what matter most in sport. And so we need to make sure we're replenishing those correctly, right? The reason we need to do this is because the game of sport has changed. Want to see a professional athlete 100 years ago compared to today? That's the difference. Right? That was a professional athlete 100 years ago. That's a professional athlete today. A lot has changed. Right? Mainly, they get paid to just play their sports. Now, the second part is we know a lot more about energy systems, and we know how to make maximize performance. In the English Premier League, I really like the game of soccer. Right? This is one of the top soccer uh, leagues in the uh, world. 50% right? more distance is covered at high speeds in the last 40 years or so. Right? People are running more sprints at high intensity. People are sprinting for longer periods of time. I used to hook up GPS monitoring systems to collegiate athletes at Division I level. When I first started this about 10 years ago, they were running six to seven miles, the top athletes. Now they're running eight and a half, the midfielders are, every single game. And they have to do a game, day off, a game later, and then they have to do that every single week for 18 weeks straight, right? It's every sort of level is increasing in speed and performance. Records are being broken. Every Olympics, we hear about a new record being broken. And athletes come in all shapes and sizes. So how do we navigate all that? How do we figure out what to put in our bodies when we do different sports, right? When we have to do, we have different energy demands, what can we do? That's my hope tonight. My beginning part here is to make you realize how your body runs a little bit, that there's some science behind it. You don't have to navigate all the science, and we're hopefully going to help you guys out a little bit. All right. Break for me. You only have two more of these things as we go through it, and then I, I'm going to make you guys stand up for next break. All right. <clears throat> have you ever had a great game or competition, right, where you felt great? What about sluggish? You ever had one of those? I bet you guys have. Now I want you guys to ask you guys, what caused the difference? Maybe just tell somebody you trust next to you. No right or wrong on this one. Okay, I'm going to predict the answers here, and I bet I get the common themes as we look at this. I bet I know the answers to what you guys just said as to why you felt good and why you didn't feel good, right? I bet it had something to do with, I felt great, everything was going great in life, right? I felt energized, high ener there'll be these positive emotions right before that great game. What about the sluggish game? I was off. I was, it was that week, that, that, remember that thing happened, that ha right? That happened, that... In science terms, we say it's this. It's your energy systems, we already talked about those, and it's your endocrine systems. That's the reason you either performed to your optimal level or did not perform to your optimal level. Energy systems, remember, phosphagen, aerobic system, and then that glycolysis system, and then the endocrine system. Sorry, I'm throwing one more science thing in here. Endocrine system is your hormones, right? It looks like this throughout your body. Your hormones are, are secreted by glands that are spread throughout the body, right? 
What they do is these hormones, they go out as certain keys, they connect to locks, receptors on your cells, and as a result of those, going, those locks, those hormones going into those receptors, your body has a reaction to those. Some of them make you feel happy. Some of them make you feel sad. Some of them give you lots of energy. Some of them, when you get scared, right, are released at such high intensity that you have a fight or flight response. Adrenaline perhaps sounds familiar. This is from the National Strength and Conditioning Association. You don't have to be able to read all those. I was just putting this up to show you. You got a lot of, a lot of hormones in your body and they change throughout life as well, right? Sometimes we're in control, sometimes not, right? But with these things, we know some stuff, right? We know, for example, that your pancreas releases insulin and what insulin does to blood glucose when it shuttles it into the cells. We know that growth hormone released by the pituitary gland has all sorts of reactions to your body that grows all parts of your body, right? Testosterone, on the other hand, only targets skeletal muscle and makes it... My point, again, is not that you guys have to memorize all this, but that you know the reason you feel a certain way or you had a good performance or a sluggish performance was because something affected your energy system and or your endocrine system. My goal, again, tonight is to show you how to regain control of both of those. The endocrine system, by the way, the hormone system, it's the reason we have stuff like this. Why does your coach have you lift five sets of two, for example? I'll tell you why. They want you to become stronger and more powerful because when you lift lower reps and heavier weights, your body releases growth hormone and testosterone a little bit, but you know what it releases a lot, right? Insulin-like growth factor, which targets some of the nerve cells, which increases the amount of nerves found in each one of your limbs, which allows you to create more force per pound. Said slowly, do you have a right hand or left hand dominance? Go try to brush your teeth tonight with the other one, right? The one that's not dominant. The reason you won't be able to brush your teeth as well is not because you have less muscle in that arm, but because you have less nerve endings in that arm. So when you're lifting heavy, you're lifting for the nervous system. You're trying to get strength and power increase, right? This is all about creating more force per pound. When you start lifting eight to 12 reps, right? Now we see testosterone coming out. Now we see growth hormone coming out at a higher level. You're lifting for hypertrophy, bigger muscles, bulkier. Right? You want to get bulky? Let's lift four sets of 12. Right? That will get you pretty bulky. Lift heavy lower weights, that will get you strong. Why do we know that stuff? We know that stuff, again, I didn't know this wouldn't be able to be read, but you guys can't necessarily read this, because when you lift a certain way and you tax your body a certain way, you put stress on your body, you have a hormonal response to that. Sometimes it's out of your control, right? The weather stresses you out. Ah, that's not your control. Sometimes you purposely stress your body out. You sprint up a hill, you lift some weights. Again, the idea there is you're actually trying to get an endocrine response. That's how you get stronger. That's how you get tougher. It's the endocrine system of hormones that actually makes us stronger. So quite a bit of science. I'm almost done with the science side here. The endocrine system plays a role in regulating mood, growth and development, tissue function, metabolism, and sexual function, and reproductive processes. In general, the endocrine system is in the charge of body processes that happen slowly, such as cell growth. In general, the endocrine system is in charge of the processes that change our bodies, right? And so therefore, they're gonna play a big role in how well we can perform as well. Pretty good? So why am I here to talk about sleep and nutrition then? Didn't I just say energy and endocrine systems, right? <clears throat> Here's why. Because if you wanna optimize performance, you have to optimize those two systems. And now, as you can probably guess, the way that you optimize those two systems is through the things that are within your control, such as sleep and nutrition. So my hope is to show you guys why this is so, so important, why you should focus on it, because it's going to affect whether you have the best performances or the worst performances, and whether you can do them day in and day out, right? Um, was it Roger Federer who, who slept, swept Wimbledon a few months ago or a couple months ago, right? Didn't lose a single match. That doesn't happen on accident, right? If you were to read his background into that and look at everything he did preparing for that, you'd be amazed at all the work and practice and sleep and nutrition that goes into that. We only see the end result. So today I'm going to talk to you guys about the, the beginning parts, right? How do you actually get to that part as well? All right, the next thing that's up after this is the rules. I'm going to have you guys stand up real quick. Move around. Go ahead and stand up. Okay, you're not done learning though while you stand up. <clears throat> I'm gonna have you guys do something real quick. I want you to make a fist, just make a fist. Okay, don't let go of it. Okay, now make like a really strong fist. Okay, don't let go. Now I mean like white knuckle, get it all out. Oh, okay, do you see what happened there? When you made a small fist, only a few muscles were involved. Then you made a bigger fist and more muscles got, when you did an all out fist, you, your stomach flexed, your shoulder flexed, that's called muscle recruitment. 
That, by the way, is a key to sport performance. The way you get better at muscle recruitment, you have to do things that are hard. Lift heavy weights, sprint, right? You have to get muscles to work together. The professional athletes that we've worked with, they don't always bench press the most, but when it comes to sport, they absolutely can recruit as many muscles as fibers as possible. Cristiano Ronaldo, you guys have heard that name before, he's a soccer player. He, he'll make $96 million this year. You know how much he can squat? You know how much he can bench press? Nobody cares how much he can spot a bench press, right? What they care is that he can put a soccer ball on a goal and that's it. And the reason he can do that probably better than most people out there is when he goes to recruit muscles, we know because we've hooked him up to him before, he recruits a lot of muscles all at once. You want to become better at sports? Learn how to do muscle recruitment by firing as many fibers as possible together. One more lesson while you guys are standing up. Okay, I want you to make like, a, like tight fingers like this, right? Okay, now keep them as tight as possible, but now try to move them while they're real tight. All right, now I want you to relax muscles. Relax them as much. Now move them as fast as you can. You just learned how muscles work. Tight muscles move really, really slow. Relax muscles move really, really fast. So when people run like this, that's too tight. You're going to run really slow. But if you run smooth and light, you just learn that muscles are pretty fast. Those are techniques to sport performance. Crazy, huh? Okay, let's go through the rules of sleep and nutrition. Take a seat again. If you guys have notes that you want to take, now would be the time. I'm going to zoom through these 10 rules, and then we'll stay for any talk. Okay, this is my final question, just to make sure your brains are turned back on or back up here. Final question for you guys of lighting up the brain. No multiple choice on this one. Each action potential traveling down a motor neuron results in a short period of activation of the muscle fibers within the motor unit. You think to move your hand, and you move your hand, right? That brief contraction that re results is referred to as a twitch, right? These stimuli may be delivered at so high a frequency that the twitches begin to merge, forming something called, oh, if you guys get this one, you're at the top of the list here. Give it a try. Give it a try. Anybody know? That's a good guess. I like the recruitment guess. Not bad. It's called, actually, it's called a tetanus, right? What happens is when your muscles twitch, and if they can't twitch very quickly, we might call those slow twitch muscles, by the way, they don't create as much force because after one twitch is done, the other one tries to go again, and you can create kind of a lot of force, right? But when muscles can twitch really fast, one right after the other, right, they start to connect. By the way, we call those fast twitch muscles, something you heard of. And they connect into something called a tetanus. You guys have probably heard of tetanus before. Maybe you've gotten a tetanus shot. Tetanus, right, all, it tries to protect us from lockjaw. Stuck. Why do we get lockjaw? Because the muscles keep contracting and they won't let go. The twitches keep happening too fast. And so as a result, it becomes a tetanus and it gets stuck. So you get a tetanus shot to prevent that. Kind of neat, isn't it, where these things... But that's also where slow twitch and fast twitch muscle fibers come from. All right, enough science. On to sleep and nutrition as we go through it.